Uh, at Google, we're committed to creating a comprehensive atlas of the world through maps and Earth. And we've made big strides uh, in this in the terms of maps and Earth. We've made big advances here on the consumer side in the form of Earth and Maps, as well as in terms of Street View and Google Maps for Mobile. We've also made big strides on the side of enterprise. And this morning, I thought I would give a little bit of an overview into two of our most recent developments on each of those, one on consumer, one on enterprise. On the consumer side, I'd like to talk about Google MapMaker. MapMaker was released in 2008, but just yesterday, we released Google MapMaker in the United States. And the idea behind MapMaker is to have our users, who have a lot of knowledge and information about the world around them, actually be the cartographers, drawing on the map, adding what they know, fixing where they see mistakes, and really making advances. This has made a huge difference. It's our estimate that in 2005, only 15% of the world's population had a detailed map of where they lived. And today, with Google MapMaker and tools like it, that's more than doubled. So let's take a look at how these edits actually work. Google MapMaker looks a lot like Google Maps. And so there's a few extra tools, which you can see there in the upper left-hand side of the map port, uh, to actually add points of interest and detail. So if in this small beach community, say, I knew there was a set of tennis courts that weren't on the map, I could switch to Arial, find the tennis courts, decide to add a point of interest and say what it is in terms of, of, of a different type of place, trace out where the tennis courts are in the image, and then add its name and any other information to it, effectively adding the North Shore tennis courts to the map. And it's really exciting to see these edits roll in. So exciting that the Google MapMaker team didn't just create MapMaker, they also created something called MapMaker Pulse, where you can actually see in real time these edits roll in. Uh, and to show this, I thought I would demonstrate with a little video, if we can go ahead and roll the video. Uh, but yesterday, for example, I was watching MapMaker Pulse come in. You can see people scrolling around the earth, figuring out where they are, adding to the map what they know. And yesterday, as I was watching the US MapMaker launch, I'm from Wisconsin, I saw someone literally go to their small town and add the firehouse right on the map. And you can see how this is improving the map all over the world, not only for those users, but for all other users who are going to see this map moving forward. adding roads, adding buildings. You can see MapMaker Pulse. There's the URL, mapmaker.google.com slash pulse. Uh, and as I said, we released the US version yesterday. Today, MapMaker is available in 187 different countries and regions, now including the US. So we hope that you all will try it out and add some things to the map that, that you know about. But we're very excited about MapMaker. Switching over to the enterprise side, uh, we've done a lot of different things over the years to help make our platform available uh, in terms of building it into map, things like our Maps API or Maps API Premier, Google Earth Pro. We've done a lot on the enterprise side to help people leverage our platform. The platform that runs things like Google Maps and Earth is really vast. It uses Google's cloud to do the computation, to literally take terabytes of information coming in from layers and edits, merging it all together to create a really comprehensive map. And it also has the benefit of scale. Today on Google Maps, we'll render hundreds of millions of map views and page views. And in moments of crisis, like around Japan, we'll see things like peaks of 8,000 requests per second for the layers uh, that are for that area. And that type of scale and that type of computation power that's in the cloud is something that we think can really benefit businesses and governments. And with that, we're really excited to make that platform available through a new product we're announcing today, which is Google Earth Builder. And to introduce Google Earth Builder and demonstrate it for you, I'd like to introduce its lead product manager, Dylan Lorimer, to the stage. Welcome, Dylan. Thank you. Great, thank you. So as Marissa said, my name is Dylan Lormer, and I'm a product manager on the Geo team focused on our enterprise business, which is a really important business to Google and to Geo. 
and is also quite tightly coupled or, or woven with our consumer mapping efforts. So for instance, if you go to a you know, highly trafficked website like rent.com and you search for a property or properties, they might be displayed on a Google map implementation, a Maps API implementation, and rent.com we're actually paying a fee to Google to use our Maps API in this context. So that's one example of kind of a typical enterprise geo customer. Another typical example would be uh, last year after the oil spill off the coast of Louisiana, the state of Louisiana used Google Earth Enterprise to stand up a common operational uh, picture or a map that many of their first responders used to collaborate uh, on the recovery and the cleanup efforts. Just another real typical example. We have been actually in the enterprise uh, geo business for about seven years now. Uh, we have more than 25,000 uh, paying customers at this point, enterprise geo paying customers, and we have an existing uh, product portfolio, Google Maps Premier, Google Earth Pro, and Google Earth Enterprise. It's an important business to Google and to geo, and it's important to our customers to be able to depend on us to use our Earth and Map products in these kind of mission critical or business critical ways. Marissa mentioned earlier that the sort of vision within GEO is to create this really high fidelity digital recreation of the world. Uh, you'll, you'll actually hear that from a lot of product managers on the GEO team when they're at these types of events. We like to lead with it. It it's really truly is an inspiring vision you know, that we have where you know, our end users, wherever they are in the world, from any device, any platform, can get access to you know, all the world's geospatial information in the palm of their hands. In support of this over the years, we have built some, some tremendous geospatial infrastructure, some geo infrastructure that we use to process all the different types of mapping content and geospatial content that we source for our products. So for instance, all the satellite imagery and the aerial photography that you see in our products, all the 3D models, the bathymetric data you know, on the seafloor in Google Ocean, the vector layers, the point of interest databases, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of data. We've built a lot of infrastructure to be able to process all this data at scale. And to date, this is literally petabytes of content. You know, last year alone, we processed greater than 20 million square kilometers of satellite imagery, all so that our end users could you know, basically pinch and zoom on their phones to view that content, that content in, in context. Businesses and governments also deal with mapping data. And they face a lot of challenges in doing so. You know, mapping data is inherently difficult to work with. Uh, it can be tremendously large in size, you know, dozens or hundreds of terabytes. It's in complex formats and, and projections. Requires you know, sometimes complicated software to use and training to use that software. And so in speaking to many of our, our enterprise mapping customers, enterprise geo customers, over the years they've actually asked if they can use this infrastructure, you know, geo's infrastructure essentially, to help them you know, build their own maps and, and manage and process their own data and publish those to their users. So they can focus a little bit less on their sort of IT infrastructure and a little, little bit more on the art of, of making maps and, and managing mapping data. And so today, we're, as Marissa said, we're delighted to uh, announce that we're bringing a lot of our, uh, our, our geo infrastructure, our cloud computing platform for geo, to the enterprise uh, space in the form of a product we're calling Google Earth Builder, which is kind of Google's mapping platform in the cloud, if you will. And our vision for Google Earth Builder is to literally productize as much of our geo infrastructure as we can. And we have this idea that all of these organizations that deal with mapping data, be it the state of Louisiana with hundreds of terabytes of data, or maybe just an organization that has a few base map layers, they should be able to easily move all of that content to Google's cloud to a single centralized repository in the cloud where designated users within the organization can manage the data and, and, and have access to the data, process the data, have access to tremendous amounts of Google computational power to process it, and then securely serve it and publish it to their users who would access it through very familiar tools, Google Earth, you know, Google Maps, Google Earth on Android devices, and so on and so forth. And so I want to cut to the demo now and give you uh, a preview of the product. We are announcing it today. It will be commercially available in Q3. Um, let's see. Resize my screen. Great. So the, the philosophy uh, behind the product was that we really wanted you to be able to manage all your data in Google's cloud. 
And you know, in our minds, that meant uh, as you, you know, we need to support all the standard formats. So you should be able to upload all of your, your imagery and your, your TIFF formats and Mr. Sid and, and JPEG formats and upload all your base map data as well. So shape files and, and tab files and some of these other common formats. And when you do that, we want to be able to extract all the relevant metadata, pull it from the headers, extract it from the sidecar files, and ultimately present you with just a nice visual catalog in the cloud. And you know, the first thing you probably want to do on that is actually uh, search for data. And so uh, what I'm going to do is oh, just search for uh, DRG. There we go. So here we go. I search for a DRG. A DRG is a raster graphic. It's a topo map, typically. And I'm going to jump into one of these that we have uploaded. Let's go into this one. And so this is, uh, you know, this is basically a TIFF file that was uploaded to the product. We extracted the relevant metadata. We generated the thumbnail, so you can get a quick preview of the content. Uh, we pro provide you with some other information about it. We actually let you define the attribution so that when you publish it, you know, the attribution that appears to end users can be specified. And you can even jump right in and get a quick preview of the data. So here I'm, I'm just jumping into this topo, and you can see that it's over an island off the coast of uh, Santa Barbara, I think. I'll show you a couple more here. Let's jump into an image. So this is a, a USGS DOQQ, I believe, um, that we uploaded. And here's a preview of it. And again, this is just a quick way to preview your data. This is the catalog in the cloud for your mapping data. Uh, this is not the end user experience. End users will be viewing the content through Google Earth and Maps, which I'll show you in a minute. But this is the, you know, the, the catalog for your map builders to use to essentially manage their data and build their maps. And uh, you can, for instance, look at Google's imagery behind it. And I can pull it back up. And here you can see that it was a, a TIFF file and a world file and a PRJ, which is the projection for the data. So we support all the standard you know, sidecar files and associated uh, you know, geospatial formats. Okay, we also support vector data. So let's uh, jump to a vector data set. Okay, I'm searching for urban, and uh, this is an urban areas data set. Okay, and here you can see it's a shape file, and there's the DBF, or DBF and some of the other associated files. We display the attribute table, so we actually parse through the data and extract that and keep a structured representation of it. You can see the polygon count and some other you know, interesting information about your base map data, but probably most interestingly, we can give you a quick preview of it. So let's uh, go here. So you can see that we're actually rendering this data dynamically, for that matter, as uh, PNG tiles on the map. And this is not styled. We'll talk about styling in a minute. This is just you've uploaded your data. You want to take a look at it. I'll show you just a few more here. These are con contours over Portland, Oregon, five-foot contours. And you know what? what I'm really trying to convey here is that on the fly, we're rendering these tiles from your data. Uh, you will be able to define styles as well. And we, you know, very detailed, dense geometries that are being rendered on the fly. Okay. And I'm going to show you just one more here before I shift over to some style data. Let's go back to the repository. and get into a list view mode, jump into populated places, and you can see the attribute table here is much larger. This is a, a world populated places data set, uh, one of the data sets we use in our public products, our consumer products. And again, just to show you that, when you beam up that data set to the cloud, we're going to parse through it, and we're going to render uh, render it all on the map for you. And again, these are just red push pins representing the data. But presumably, you want to style the data. You don't want just all to be red push pins or green contour lines. You want to apply some cartographic styling to it so that as your users view it and zoom in you know, to greater levels of detail, maybe different features are, are rendered on the map, and you use different colors to render them, things like that. So let me show you a, a vector data set I just styled the other night. Uh, this is seismic data for the United States. And 
I'm not a geologist, so the colors mean nothing other than I thought they looked really cool. Um, zoom in again here. So here we have, again, dynamically rendered seismic data, you know, basically polygons representing some kind of a seismic classification for the continental United States with a style that I defined where I said where the type of seismic classification is you know, X, Y, or Z, then render, the, render it yellow, you know, otherwise render it blue or pink. Show you one more here. And, and really, the, the, I guess the, the magic, so to speak, that we're showing here is that these are all dynamically rendered data sets. So you upload your, your shape file, your vector file once, and you can define these styles and publish it all over the web. You know, embed it in public websites for the tourism purposes, embed it in, uh, you know, stream it to the Earth client securely for the purposes of, of you know, disaster recovery or response. Uh, but you define that style once and it's rendered dynamically. So there are lakes rendered uh, yellow. And I don't know that lakes are typically yellow, but okay, just a few more things I want to show you here. So as far as when you create these maps and you want to, or layers, and you want to share them with your users, it's basically as easy as sharing a Google Doc with your users if you've ever done that. There's a common sharing kind of widget we use at Google and a common sharing experience, and we support standard Google accounts. And so I can uh, create a map and share it with some group of users. In this case, I've defined this set of access controls as Altostrat end users. I just made up that name. But I can easily add a colleague, Matt Toon. Oh, let's spell that right. Matt Simpson. There we go. So I can, I can share this map with Matt Simpson. And then when he opens up the Google Earth client, he will just see these layers available to him. And uh, we're also publishing through several widely used OGC standards, such as WMS, and exposing the content through Maps and Earth APIs. Let me jump over to the end user experience uh, and first to show you one last thing, which is metrics. So as you publish these maps out and your end users are authenticating to view the content if it's, if it's uh, access controlled, we're also providing you as an organization, you know, managing your data in the cloud and building maps with you know, some insightful metrics on consumption or your viewership, essentially, of the maps. And so this is kind of the heartbeat of your maps, if you will. This is a near real-time chart of people accessing your layers. And we definitely have this, this vision that we can provide you with you know, a lot of meaningful information about your users you know, viewing your mapping data, essentially. Let me go ahead and switch over to the end user experience now. Okay, so I've, this is Google Earth, as you, many of you have used. Uh, I've already authenticated, I'm not gonna take you through that, but effectively we've added Google account authentication support to the Google Earth client. So with your standard Google you know, Gmail account or your, 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 dash, your uh, Google Apps account, you can log in. And what I'm gonna do here is I have some additional groups of layers that are available to me as an individual. And this is because I've logged in, I'm in the access control list, they're presented to me. And so I wanted to show a few. So here we go. These are, uh, these are the topos that I briefly showed you in the data catalog. These are topo maps for some island off the coast of Santa Barbara. And you can see that basically we process the data uh, at scale at Google for you at the click of a button and then render it into these layers or create these layers which we stream. And then right at the edge of your, Im your imagery, Google's content picks up. So you basically are overlaying your content right on top of Google's. That's one example. Okay, here we go. Here's just another global data set I processed. It's a very coarse resolution um, uh, global uh, imagery data set spanning the world. And uh, I can actually zoom in a little bit and show you that same this is the same layer, the, uh, the seismic layer that I styled and I showed you in the browser, which you can publish out through Maps API. This, ooh, this is the same layer working in the Earth client. Again, one style, one layer published to me with access control, served over you know, HTTPS and so on and so forth. And then lastly, show you another one here. Ooh. These are some images in Montana that we grabbed from uh, our friends at the Montana GIS Clearinghouse and thought I would show you that 
you know, we blend these images, we deal with all the processing of them, the blending, the feathering, the masking. I can actually turn off Google's content and show you how it's really a layer served right on top of Google Earth and it'll sit right on top of our maps, uh, map space map as well through the Maps API. You can turn on Google's content right on top of it as well and really get the benefit of both. And lastly, turn on this topo here. And you can see that I also processed a topo for, for a whole huge area of Montana. And again, you can see that it's, it's uh, you know, served to me over HTTPS authenticated. So this, this is the idea of the end user experience, your users using tools they already know how to use, requiring little or no training, accessing you know, your mapping content essentially for you know, business purposes or whatever it may be. You can also publish content to the public. You don't need to access you know, to protect it with access controls. So in the event of a disaster response scenario, you can put up maps on your websites. You can serve entire Google Earth globes with hundreds of terabytes of imagery if you want, you know, to your users. Uh, really, kind of any situation where you need to build maps, you know, our, our vision is to, to let you do that in the cloud. And so I think with that, I will hand it back to Marissa. Do I have the, there you go. Thank you, Dylan. You're welcome. Uh, so that's a little bit about what's new for us in consumer and in enterprise software. Dylan and I will be here for the remainder of the day. You can approach us or check out, uh, check out our booth and try out the tools and give us feedback. Thank you.